From the beginning of written language, writers have focused their stories on singular characters. One of the first written stories, The Epic of Gilgamesh, focused on the timeline of one man, Gilgamesh. Since then, almost every written narrative has been centered on the actions of a single character. These characters have been named heroes. The origin of the word is the Greek heros, which means protector. Originally, the word was used to denote someone who had done great deeds, most often at the expense of his own life. They were usually an icon of particular virtue or character trait. Heroes were considered to be righteous in the eyes of the reader. The hero was the good guy. Usually, they were over-exaggerated beings of pure goodwill. It can be dangerous to believe these stories, however, because they, can almost, they are almost always false. When inspected with a different lens, these stories can show the hero in a completely different light. The hero of these stories can sometimes be immoral and downright despicable. Sometimes the main character of the story is deemed the hero even though his actions have been less than exemplary. Oftentimes, the line between what is moral and immoral can be hard to define within a hero tale. The storyteller deems someone to be the hero when they are not as righteous or good-natured as it may seem. They are not defined by their moral character, but by something else. More often than not, the group that wins the conflict is the one who is allowed to tell the story. Whether because the other party was completely extinguished after the conflict, or because they were no longer trusted to write history, their story is not usually told. The, cult the, the culture that defeats the other is given the benefit of telling all the stories. The victor, boosted by the exaggerations of propaganda, tells stories of perfect heroes and villains. This leads to a situation where the victor tells a story in a more positive light than would otherwise be true and the force that was once known as evil is deemed a heroic force. How does a force or culture decide who is the hero when many people usually combine to the effort? Historians tend to focus their stories on the happenings of a single person or group. It is almost impossible to focus on large groups when considering events in history. People often focus on the actions of a single protagonist, warriors, leaders, and leaders, which can lead to over-exaggerated ideas and beliefs that a single person did the work of hundreds. With all this in mind, how can one trust the stories of heroes? Stories must be examined from the source to understand the heroes that dominate them. There are multiple definitions of a hero, and most of the time, they are the main character of the narrative and the focus of the story. Other times, the, the hero is a character in the story who performs some righteous action, saving the day. This archetype is present in nearly every story from ancient times to modern day. The story of Hercules is one of these stories that makes the hero out to be a righteous man, in this case, a little god. Uh, he was always saving the day and fighting evil monsters to save the lives of others. He could easily be defined as righteous by any onlooker. The righteous hero is usually, or the righteous hero is one of the main types of heroes in all of literature. Heroes like Hercules actually come into power to combat, or usually come into power to combat some heinous villain or evil force. Another story that shows a good hero is that of Odysseus in the Iliad. He solves many of the main problems in the story with his shrewd thinking and prowess as a warrior. One of his most heroic moments is that of the night raid. Odysseus leads a small group of Greek soldiers into an enemy camp undetected, using tactics that were not seen up until this point in history. Odysseus sneaks up on an enemy camp by night and scouts it out. Quote, they went their way like two lions prowling by night amid the armor and blood-stained bodies of them that had fallen. Unquote. His stealth and cunning were, was a major turning point in the war, and he was viewed heroically for it. His most heroic characters, characteristic was his drive to get back home to his wife, Penelope. In this era of time, coming home from war was almost never an option. The fact that Odysseus not only survived, but had the strength and courage, strength, courage, and moral fiber to return to his faithful wife is astonishing within the context. He braved many evils, avoided the temptations of the sires, or, he braved many evils, avoided the temptations of the sirens, witches, and magical drug flowers. Odysseus, Odysseus is a good example of a nearly ideal hero. He is clever, strong, and usually a good one. Sometimes these stories of heroes can be filled with ideals that are not exactly realistic. The, these ideals are missing from the story of Don Quixote. He filled his mind with the stories of heroes from the medieval period who believed that he could actually achieve the high standards of the old heroes. He became insane trying to become a hero from a fairy tale. He believed that the world was once home to such creatures as giants, witches, and evil knights. He once assaulted a man because he was trying to water his wounds. Uh, quote, one of the character, or carriers who was who were in the inn thought fit to water his feet and it was necessary to remove Don Quixote's armor as it lay on the truck. Seeing this, Don Quixote raised his eyes to heaven, dropping his buckler, he lifted his lance with both hands, and with it smote such a blow on the carrier's head that he stretched him on the ground. So stunned that had he followed it up with a second, there would have been no need of the surgeon to cure him. Uh, he mistakenly believed that since he was a hero, he was quite really good. While the servant may have been wrong to leave the armor, he did not deserve to be assaulted. 
When Don Quixote decided that he wanted to be a man errant, everyone thought that he was insane. He thought that he could be perfect and purely good, even though human, even though no human has ever seen him do. Everyone has flaws, but also good qualities. People have done heroic deeds and sacrificed life and honor for the betterment of others. But no one can stand up to the qualities of human heroes. Heroes like Hercules, Achilles, and Odysseus are shown, shown to be moral lighthouses shining out over the masses. It seems like saving the day is their permanent pastime. Some may ask why writers and storytellers craft their main character into such perfect bastions of moral perfection. And the answer is actually simple. Most people prefer to hear stories of heroic people, but sometimes the truth is more complicated. Even though almost nobody wants to hear a story about an evil person, many times one slips in. Even though a character is made out to be a hero, they can sometimes be less than a perfect role model. Sometimes the villain just happens to save the day, and as Shakespeare says, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness to rest upon. This would cause them to be known as the heroes even though they're not actually great people at all. In ancient history, writers could not simply show a bad guy doing good or a hero doing evil, so sometimes they would have to blur the blind people. They needed to portray their heroes as righteous no matter what evil they committed along the way. There is no better example of the, uh, there is no better example of this than Odysseus, who was, up until this point, viewed as a hero. The Odyssey, a book named after him, features his adventures throughout the world as he tries to return to his home. Along the way, his less than moral character begins to show. Although many of the feats he accomplished were heroic in nature, he was not always a grown up. He was deceitful, unfaithful, and downright mean. Once, Odysseus tricked the Cyclops into believing his name was No Man, and, the ter uh, and when the terrifying Cyclops was stabbed in the hive, he cried out, No man is killing me by fraud, no man is killing me by force. He deceived the Cyclops with sheep's wool and by saying that his name was Nobody. He was unfaithful to his wife which, while she went to the extreme measures to stay faithful while he was gone. The Romans, when they write about their version of Odysseus, refer to him as Dearest Ulysses, or Cruel Odysseus. He gained this title not from his enemies, but from his allies. They witnessed what he did to his enemies when he stabbed the Cyclops and bore the red hot beam, eye, beam into his eye for the boiling bloods bubbled all over as we worked it round and round so that the steam from the burning eyeball scalded his eyelids and eyebrows and his hideous yells made the cave ring again. They knew that he was a liar, cheater, and cruel warrior. One of his worst moments was his contribution to the idea of the Trojan horse, which is probably his most cruel and deceitful plan. He proposed the idea of a giant wooden horse in which a small armed force would hide. The horse would be dragged to the gates of the enemy city where it was accepted as a gift of peace. Little did the Trojans know that inside the horse was 30 of the best soldiers Greece had to offer, waiting for night, waiting for night. Once the sun had set and all the Trojans had fallen fast asleep, the Greek soldiers crept out of the deceitful horse and opened the gates, letting, the Greek army, letting in the Greek army according to Odysseus' plan. The horse stands open wide. Fighters in high spirits pouring out of its timbered cavern, in, cavern into the fresh air. They steal on the city, buried deep in sleep and wine. They butcher, butcher the guards, fling wide the gates, and hug their cold horse, poised to combine forces. Plot complete. They slaughtered and pillaged the unexpected city. Although Odysseus was the central in the war, one should think about the story from the perspective of the Greeks. This would most likely have been seen as a breach of unspoken rules of warfare and etiquette. This act is similar to the modern day act of chemical bombing. It was almost completely unexpected because it was, un it was against an unspoken law. Odysseus was the author of this plan, and the blood of the Trojan slaughter was on his hands. Odysseus was not a perfect person, and yet gained the honor of hero throughout the story. Many times, the hero of the story is not chosen for his merit, but because he ended up as the victor. In every conflict, there are two opposing sides, which have differing opinions, worldviews, and goals. The parties have a different idea of what is good, what is wanted, and what is heroic. Everyone believes that their cause is righteous and will not think differently until someone informs them and changes their mind. But no one likes to be told that they are wrong, and what better way to avoid being told than to silence the voices of the opposing side? The loser is almost always made out to be evil, wrong, and less than the victor. The victor does this through propaganda. They craft the enemy into an evil monster sometimes, and their own soldiers into perfect heroes. Once one side is victorious, almost all that can be remembered is the propaganda. So after a conflict, the story can change to make the hero into a perfect hero. Even though the victor may have been brutal and did many evil deeds, he won. He won the conflict and he is deemed a hero. This can be applied on all levels of magnitude. Countries are deemed in the right because they have conquered another, but this can also happen with smaller groups. Groups such as the KKK prospered in Reconstruction Era, uh, Reconstruction Era America. 
because they were practically brainwashed by the propaganda of slavery. They are viewed by many in the antebellum South as heroes, even though their racist actions were blatantly evil. Sometimes a small group or person can beat all the odds and become heroic by speaking out or by victory. In the Peloponnesian War, there is a story of a few Spartan soldiers going up against a massive war machine of Xerxes Archon. In that spot, the Greeks defended themselves with daggers, those who had any of them left, yes, and with their hands and with their teeth. And the barbarians buried them in missiles. They fought so bravely against the giant force that their stories spread around the Greeks, and when they were defeated, they were deemed the heroes. But given the situation, if they were defeated easier, the armies of Xerxes would have been hailed as the victors and as the heroes. Xerxes and his armies were atrocious and evil, but had they been victorious, they would have been known as the heroes in this conflict. Perhaps the film 300 would have focused on the heroism of the Persian hordes of destruction of the Greeks rather than the bravery of the 300 Spartans. This reversible truth happens many times in history and is almost impossible to spot without investigation. Cultures are squashed under the foot of more powerful foes. The stories of a dead culture are not told. Therefore, their point, die, their point of view dies with their civilization. Meanwhile, the concrete culture has the benefit of telling their story, usually positive, no matter if it be true or not. Cultures will conquer other cultures and brand themselves to be in the right. But one might ask why they often choose a single person to be the hero. They themselves, some, uh, they style themselves to be the most righteous and heroic, but they often elect one individual to be the figurehead of their success. This individual is referred to as a hero, whether they are a perfect example of moral greatness or not. In the case of Odysseus, he was chosen to be the hero, not for his upstanding moral compass, but for his strategic prowess. Although he was not a righteous man, husband, or friend, he was a superior commander and warrior who saved many lives. He protected the men of his ship when he tricked the Cyclops and turned the tide of the war with this idea of the Trojan horse. For all of his downfalls and misdoings, he was an essential proponent in the battles he fought. If, he did, if it was not for his victory and cunning, he would not be hailed as a hero. Rather, one of the Trojan soldiers would be known as the warrior who killed Odysseus, making him a hero. Every soldier, crew member, and citizen played a role in the story of the Odyssey, and yet it was Odysseus who was chosen as the hero. This is because it is hard for storytellers to focus on too many things at once. And as humans, we tend to only be able to understand singular events and timelines. An author could not write a history of, of a country from the perspective of every single citizen. We have to focus on the lives of a smaller group of people. Everyone's perspective is different, so it is nearly impossible to give an accurate depiction of a mass of people's experience. Instead, writers tend to focus on the lives of one or more characters in the story. We witnessed this happen uh, all throughout media and history. Instead of describing every story of piracy in the Golden Age, we focus on well-documented, extraordinary individuals like Francis Drake. Instead of trying to grasp the massive str struggle that was the Napoleonic era, we gravitate towards leaders and great figures like Alexander I of Russia and Napoleon Bonaparte, the latter of whom gained so much focus that an entire era is named after him. This was an era of massive political change. Many wars were fought and many events took place. This era, in, uh, this era impacted about 30 different countries and resulted in some of the largest political shifts in history and was named for one man. The reason is because Napoleon, while only one man, was so influential that he affected everyone in the period. He was the domino that caused all the other dominoes to fall. When, when the first domino causes every other domino to fall, people focus on that as the cause. Imagine someone trying to focus on domino number 349 out of 1,000. One would barely be able to understand anything about the story. However, if the first domino knocks 999 others over, then one can believe that that single domino is responsible for every other domino collapsing. <clears throat> Man's mind cannot grasp the causes of events in their completeness, but the desire to find those causes is implanted in man's soul. And without considering the multiplicity and complexity of the conditions, uh, of the conditions, any one, with, any one of which taken separately may seem to be the cause, he snatches at the first approximation to a cause that seems intelligible to him and says, this is the cause. And after that, the will of those who stood in the most prominent position, the heroes of history. This is the same idea that makes people gravitate towards a single protagonist or hero of the story. They are usually the catalyst for the rest of the story. Therefore, they become the focus and eventually the hero. A hero can be a difficult role to define. Sometimes the hero is the protagonist of the story, while other times the hero is just a random person who did a remarkable thing. When someone thinks of a hero, they usually think of someone who, someone saving the day, defeating evil, or sacrificing themselves. This archetype is no more visible than in the superheroes of the Golden Age. 
They were often believed to be nearly perfect people who saved the day in one. One can see a similar stereotype in that of some of the ancient heroes like Hercules, Achilles, and Odysseus. They are almost always described as close to the gods, Hercules especially. Uh, their moral positions were blown out of proportion in relation to life. This is a dangerous trend to follow, for it can lead to people believing that this level of heroism is achievable in the real world. Such is the case with Don Quixote of La Mancha, who read stories of medieval heroes and believed that he could, he could be one himself. The old man was just insane trying to achieve all the things that he read heroes do. He tried to rescue a non-existent princess and fight giants, windmills. Uh, he believed that these perfect heroes were extant in the real world. These heroes, be they real or not, may seem like perfect bastions of moral greatness. But when one looks deeper, it is evident that they are not. These people have been proclaimed to be heroes, but underneath they are nothing but mirages. In ancient history, stories were told in a black and white manner. They were either portrayed as good or evil. They were even, either given heroic or villainous motives. Odysseus is one of Homer's great heroes who, although portrayed to be a hero, was not a perfect person by any stretch of the word. He was deceitful, cruel, and unfair. But he was shown to be the hero of the sum of, through the sum of his actions. He saved the lives of many men and won many battles, but the cost of being a scoundrel. However, he was described by Homer to be the hero of the Odyssey. How could he be the hero when he was a genuinely malicious and unsavory person? The answer is simple. He was the victor. And to the victor, he was the spoils of war are the love and appreciation of one's country. Whether it be by propaganda or by simply wiping out naysayers, the victor is always held up as the hero. Even if a blatantly evil force were to win the war, they would be known as the good guys by the people. Even though the entire culture may regard themselves as righteous, how does one choose a hero? A culture cannot focus their entire respect on and gratitude on a large group without much difficulty. It is much easier to focus on the adventures of the single person than the There have been many heroes throughout the ages, and they have all been different. Some have been moral, while some have been less so, and many have been known to blur the line of good and evil. They have come into the spotlight, and the eyes of the entire culture are on. Those people held up with the highest honor, whether they are of strong moral fiber or not, are called heroes. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. We'll begin in just a moment. Your use of Tolstoy's quote about the difficulty of understanding a historical process and our tendency to relate particular events in history to individual characters um, seems pretty convincing. Uh, it's very difficult to understand the full scope of what something ha 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 how something happens in history. And so kind of boiling it down to the one big personality um, uh, is pretty, pretty tempting to do that. And, um, and then oftentimes we call that person a hero. Um, so Napoleon gets to be a hero. And um, you know, throughout War and Peace, Tolstoy pretty decisively shows that Napoleon was a bit of a nut in many ways. And that his ability to influence events was greatly exaggerated beyond the actual history involved. And um, So as, as you might say, a human tendency, it's, it's pretty undeniable that, that, that this goes on. And um, it also seems very likely that when we are grateful for a particular individual, uh, we tend to think of them as a good person. You know, something good came to us in our life, um, therefore they must have been a good person. You know, the fact that, you know, Uncle Alfred was a drug dealer, kind of gets pushed over if he gave us a big inheritance. You know, Uncle Alfred, you know, got a big load of cash from him. And so, you know, it was, you know, he was, you know, he was, sometimes he was a drug dealer. But uh, we tend to look favorably upon those when we receive favor from. Um, now, the, our, all those aspects seem to be fairly, fairly standard parts of human experience. And um, would you, would you say that that is what heroism is, or is there, you might say, a more ideal understanding of what heroism is? I mean, that, that there tends to be what people 
call hero, and then there is what is zero. And uh, would you maybe distinguish uh, each of those things if there is a distinction in the way you understand it? Yeah, so I think that um, there is definitely a difference between what we call a hero and what is actually like a heroic. Uh, and I say in my paper that nobody's perfect, but sometimes people rise to vacation and do great things. So I think that, you know, even though Odysseus was quite a bad person in a lot of situations, he rose to the occasion and he's still called a hero because he did great things for the for the people. So I think that the the definition of what we call heroes uh, are just like people who do good. And what is truly a hero is different. The person who's truly a hero does good through their uh, misdoings. And the person, the person that we call a hero would be someone who's just like always good and always mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the case of Odysseus, it certainly seems to have uh, moral faults to him. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I always find it very interesting how oftentimes you know, people will fault Odysseus for it. You know, he sleeps with Calypso and, and Circe too. And, uh, you know, when you read that, you say, oh, he's a bad guy. And then you stop and realize, you know, 20 years after being gone from his wife, he's refusing to marry Calypso and sits by the water each day looking out of the water and weeping over uh, his separation from his wife. And, uh, you know, when Calypso is there offering him marriage uh, and the offer of forgetting, um, you know, that's pretty amazing that he does that. And so, uh, sort of, in one aspect, yeah, he's got problems. In other aspect, he's a sort of hero of, you know, continuing to strive to get back to your beloved and, and that fidelity that's, that's there. Um, and so, how, in looking at the concept of heroism and saying that, sure, no, you're never going to find somebody who's a perfect hero, um, how lenient do you apply your concept of heroism? Um, you, know, you see something good in someone, does that mean that you can look over all the rest? Or is there kind of a point where you say, you know what, no. No, I'm I'm sorry, this is I'm done with your with your your lying and your cheating and you know you, you have no more place of heroism in my in my heart. Uh, and how what did it take to come to that point with a character where you kind of say, All right, you may be a hero, but you're a hero in name only. Yeah, you got the spotlight, you got the book about you, but you're no hero to me. Uh, I think it's on a case to case basis because it's always different on like what the, the action was that he did that was heroic and what the misdoings were. So like, if someone saved the entire world from something but was kind of just a, a mean dude and not a very nice guy, like in that situation you would still hold him up as the hero because he saved everyone on earth. But like if it was the guy who happened to stop a bank robbery, or like a, a store robbery and disarm the guy, then in the real life he's like a drug dealer and a, a criminal himself. That guy, you'd probably say, well, he's not much of a hero. He may have saved that store, but he was still a bad guy. So it's on a, a basis of two scales. You have to weigh which is more important, the, the action that they did or the misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. Well, then taking a specific example, but it's case by case. I mean, when you look at Odysseus, how would you say at the end of the day that Odysseus uh, sits in your heart and, and why? I mean, what, it, when you think, you know, somebody says, tell me about Odysseus. You know, are you going to roll your eyes or are you going to gush? You know, what, how, what ends up being kind of the end of the day takeaway for you in looking at a particular character like Odysseus? Well, for Odysseus, I, I find that in the end, he is the hero because he, because of his victory through the, in the Trojan War and his, um, and his coming back to his wife. Those are both two things that basically outweigh his misdoings throughout, and they, his misdoings led up to him being able to do the things that he achieved the victory and his coming back to his wife. If he hadn't, you know, been a deceiver and a tricker and a cheater, he would probably not have gotten back to his wife or probably not won with the Trojan War. So uh, those two events weigh out differently. So I would say that he ends up being the hero. Mm -hmm. And also, what you say about heroes oftentimes being, being victors? Um, yeah, when people win, they end up tending to, to look good in the history books. Um, and there are exceptions to that. You can think of people who are victors that you still just say, no, he was a thug. Uh, but um, 
But very often times that's the case. Now, are you saying that that's something that is just a human tendency, or are you saying that that is something that um, is what heroism is? I mean, is heroism getting the glossy picture in the history book and the, and the accolades about you in the history book, or is there is there something else to heroism besides that? I, I do think that there is um, there is true good and true nature that has to come through for someone to be known as a hero. You know, coming back to his wife, uh, Odysseus was a moral action. He was doing that for a good purpose. But for someone who wasn't doing a quite moral action, and then they're still portrayed as the hero, for the people in their culture, they might be defined as a hero. But if you look at it from the outside, or even if you're in the culture, you take a step back, you're going to look at them and say, well, that's not they didn't do some great things, and they were pretty bad. They were a thug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does seem to be a sort of fake heroism, you know, a heroism of the movie cameras, and then a heroism that's behind things. And um, if there is true heroism and there's imitation heroism, uh, do you see means by which we could become um, detached from, you might say, enslavement to imaginary heroism? I mean, or enslavement to the to the misuse of heroism, uh, or I mean, or I, or or do you feel comfortable that this oftentimes happens and, and it's just not something we should really try to work against? Yeah, I think that uh, it's just something you've got to be on the lookout for personally. Like you can't give in to uh, just you can't read a story and say, well, that's because the writer wrote him as the hero, so he must be the hero in the story. You have to look at it from an outside source or from a different perspective and say. Uh, find the real truth, not just the truth that the author is trying to show. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, what would be characteristics that you would look to in trying to ascertain the, the real litmus test of um, a heroic nature? Well, you could look at literature from the opposing side, often has true, or more, sometimes it's more evil than what's truly happening, but usually you can find somewhere in the middle where the true actions are shown. Uh, in the literature of the opposing side for the, the defeated side. Mm -hmm. Being willing to listen to the, the account of the detractors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Other questions? Um, well, you're kind of talking about this with the stage, but would you say that there is any like true heroes being that for the hero's side, like let's say if they were leading a war into some other place, um, they would be honored because they were leading the war, doing the fight. But the opposing side, that's a terrible person, like they're killing all our people. Like, how does that balance out for a true hero? Yeah, it's it's really hard to define because like for some people, if you're the defeated country, that person is like the worst. They're the, the anti. Or the, they're the villain of the story, but I think you have to look at the way that they they uh, view themselves, like or the, the you got to find the middle ground between the two cultures. So like the way that the, the victor side looks at themselves, if they're saying we just killed a bunch of people, or if they're saying like we're doing God's work today and you know killing all these people, uh, and then look at the way that the the defeated force says, and they if they're saying well we didn't do that bad, they're just conquering us and letting us live, or if they're like, we slaughtered our entire cities. There's gonna be a big difference between those two. So you can find you know, a true hero by looking at both sides and finding the true center. Thank you. Yeah, I wanna ask more about the nature of heroism and its, uh, its necessary connection to um, uh, the danger put to one put to oneself and, and heroism being acted out in a, a context of danger. Uh, when you were criticizing uh, Odysseus for the uh, scheme of the Trojan horse and more generally his craft, you said, this would most likely have been seen as a breach of outspoken rules of warfare and etiquette. This act is similar to the modern day act of chemical bombing. And uh, yeah, I, I remember, I um, can't remember who said it, but uh, somebody basically said, the gun, the gun was the end of heroism. Okay, when you could put a gun into somebody's hand and they could stand and um, you know swords and the archers, you know whatever, or the the 
cowards because they have the bravery of being out of range for the other person. Um, whereas nowadays, yeah, you can you know snipe someone from unreachable distances or bomb them from unreachable distances. There's still heroism in doing something above that level. Uh, if you if you go into the battle and you put your life on the line and battle it out with more people, then you can still be a hero by, you know, uh, I forget the story of people actually fighting hand-to-hand -hand and stuff in, in modern day wars and all that, where they're using guns against hand-to-hand -hand soldiers, where it's like, that wasn't exactly fair, but then there's times where it is exactly fair, uh, where both sides are evenly matched, and that's where you kind of put the line of heroism. So like, both sides are coming at each other with swords, or both sides are coming at each other with guns, that's where the so you would say heroism, at least in the field of battlefield conflict, needs a sort of proportionality of um, uh, response from each side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, when it's remarkably disproportional, you know, you guys have guys with machine gun mowing down a, a, a cavalry charge with sabers. This is not um, this is not uh, bravery. This is just superiority. You also talked about uh, that when the victor, the victor is allowed to craft the story. And you use as an example the KKK and Antebellum South. Had the Confederacy won, are you suggesting that we would all believe that the right is in the racism? That the right side, the heroic side, is the racist, slave-owning side. Yeah, um, it's hard to play what-if games because you can never really know what would happen, but I feel like in that situation, yeah, you would find a lot more, if not, they may not be holed up as heroes, but a lot more leniency towards it because, you know, I believe that good will win out eventually in most situations, so we might find out that racism is just terrible, even the people in the NFL out there that it was terrible, but, um, there would be a lot more leniency and more, you know, heroes of the time coming through instead of all just racist evil people. You know, I remember when criticism of American soldiers by, it was actually the time of the Iraq War, when criticism of American soldiers that uh, Americans are cowards. They just, you know, have all their big equipment and, you know, their flyover bombers and um, that uh, they would never, you know, go and meet people directly in battle. And, you know, as, as you know, when, uh, uh, particularly in the second Iraq war, uh, we just wiped out the Iraqis. And uh, it's almost comic. It was, I, I can't remember, it was actually something like 20 days and we were at Baghdad and there's just no opposition that would stop our, our military supremacy. And um, in a military conflict, if you don't respect your enemy in the end, how can you really have a peace? Uh, to say that you were beaten by people that you see as inferior to you in courage, um, doesn't that make any peace unstable? Where you're just looking at it and saying, you know what, these we were not beaten in by, in by a worthy foe. We were beaten by a bunch of Odysseuses, this crafty. And uh, is it necessary uh, in the context of war to be able to establish a true heroism, that you are heroic figures, that when you, you know, at the end of the day, um, you fought, your opponent knows that you beat them because you fought well. And I don't know if you remember the remember Ajax meeting Odysseus down in Hades and Ajax's response to Odysseus. And Ajax is just still infuriated at it. Because yeah. they had the wrestling match. And Odysseus won the wrestling match by putting out Ajax's joint. Right. And it was just some tricky wrestling move. And he beat him that way. And Ajax was a man of honor. And he said, if we're going to wrestle, we're going to have a match and fight fair. And Odysseus cheated. And so even down in Hades, there's never going to be reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And so far as we are not willing to fight with, you know, equal courage, equal courage, do we risk never really being able to have reconciliation with our enemy? 
Yeah, it's definitely very difficult, especially when you're technologically advanced, because you're almost, you know, always going to be fighting a side that is less than or less powerful than you. So, as Americans, it's it's very hard to find a, an enemy that will be a fair fight most of the time. You know, like if we were to go up against Russia, we might Victor might be like, okay, you did you fought well, and, or the sorry the loser might be like, oh, you fought well and good job, you won fairly, but Going against you know Iraqis, it's it's a lot easier to beat them, so it's it's harder to find a true hero in that situation. And that situation, the, the Iraqi soldier who saved the lives of all of his men by pulling them out or you know fighting well against the Americans, that guy you can look at more as a hero than just the bomber pilot who was just carbon bombing miles and miles of land. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to find a true hero or a true good side when you know, the sides are so easy. Or mm -hmm. I'd like to look more at your comment, the victor to the victor belongs to spoils, in the context of the paper, the spoils is the admiration of heroism. Um, and I was wondering if one could easily argue the opposite, that when you are the victor, that um, you are just resented. You're not turned into a hero, you're resented. And uh, one, <laughs> one funny comment a friend of mine made, uh, uh, in the relationship of Americans to Europeans, that uh, Europeans always resent Americans. And the way he explained it was very simple. He said, during the 20th century, Europe completely failed twice. And both times, the younger, upstart American had to come to them and save them. The nations of Europe, twice in the 20th century, had to have America come and save them. And because of that, the European nations will never forgive them. <laughs> That's what you get. Uh, and you know, America came in, and we had the technical superiority. We came in over through kind of the stupid European infighting between the countries, and actually had a noble attitude to rebuild the conquered. We're not going to just you know have uh, reparations to try to you know beat down our enemies. And actually, they acted in an honorable way. And what has that earned us? <laughs> Okay. Well, there's kind of a, there's always going to be a sort of sense of um, you know you say this and I won't forg I'll never forgive you. And I mean also watch on sports teams when some team comes along and just clobbers another team. Very rarely does it seem that the the clobbered team says, "Wow, they were great." Uh, they say, "You know what?" They get mad. And they say, you know, I could believe how many times that, you know, the ref made bad calls for them. And they were getting away with cheating. And you just have all of this talk that when you're a victor, um, people want to knock you down. Yeah. Um, is it really true that victory brings us admiration? I think it brings admiration for, from the people inside the, the culture, that victory culture. So, like, for the sports teams. Everyone on the outside is going to be mad at the team that just bulldozes everyone. But the people from the country that's winning, they're ecstatic. They're like, we're the greatest team on, you know, whatever. Uh, and same thing with countries, you know. Europe might uh, resent us for doing that, but we feel pretty great about, you know, winning World War II and World War I and all that. So it's like, it's, it's a more personal, like, we feel good about ourselves for doing that. And then, if we conquer, we haven't had much conquering in recent times, but if we were to go and conquer areas and make our own people the people of that area, we would try to teach, you know, we won and we're the good guys and we're the heroes there. So I feel nowadays we don't conquer as much as we just beat and then back off. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more, um, you know, there's a lot more leniency to have presented. Mm -hmm. um. Uh, one lecture we looked at this morning was on the effect of suffering and uh, how suffering oftentimes is one of those things that kind of makes us man up. And is victory, in a sense, the opposite? Um, I had a friend of ours who uh, lived through World War II in Germany, came to the United States shortly after, and um, she really doesn't like American war movies. In our American war movies, we always portray ourselves as the good guys. American good guy rolls in, and you know we, uh, we we have this sort of love affair with our own self-esteem. And um, uh, <laughs> her comment was, Americans in all their pompous war movies. 
Yeah, right. uh, she, you know, she, and she lived in the United States since she was like 12 years old. You know, and very much lived in the culture and still resented the sort of um, self-gratifying pomp of American war movies. And by being the victor and assuming your own heroic stature, have we created a sort of <laughs> is this French phrase? Um, Nasserie allemand, uh, German foolishness, and it refers to the French view of the Germans. The Germans are always, you know, so over intellectual that they become kind of silly. And have we? As, is there a sort of American foolishness where we assume our own righteousness, our own goodness, and in so doing, don't see our own corruption just because? We have been victorious. Yeah, I think it's it's pretty easy to see that that's often the case, and I think it's case it's the case with a lot of countries and stories and things. We always people always believe that they're they're just the just the right answer. So for a country that's beat, they might have movies about the tragedy of their loss, and they look at themselves as like we were beaten so hard by these people, and it's a tragic occasion. Uh, and as Americans, we have stories of us like being the great always victorious Americans. Um, and so I think you just have to, um, uh, you just, you gotta be on the lookout because all, um, all cultures kind of do the same thing, I think. I haven't been a part of another culture besides our own for the most part. So you might, I might be wrong, but I think that most cultures have that uh, nature to just say, no, we're the, we're the right party and we're the better one. Yeah, I had to say the question, it's so curious for me that I, I went out and I wanted to find a, a German made World War II movie. Right. You know, you, you understand kind of the American way it always ends up. And I mean, how, what, what would a German World War II movie be like? And there's, there's a movie called Stalingrad. And, you know, Germans have World War II movies. And, uh, you know, I think, how do you, as a German, make a World War II movie? Right. And, uh, you know, I watched this movie and it was a very, uh, it was a very disturbing movie. Uh, it just, you know, it was that, yeah, it's, it's the Germans versus the Russians, and there's this one scene where there's this Russian tank that just comes over a German foxhole and sits there spinning, grinding up the German soldiers in the foxhole. And you're thinking, wow, how do you, you know, think about that? And the attitude, the end, I felt the end of the movie was just an attitude of saying, war is hell. It really is hell, and then you lose. And um, I'm not sure if that's a better vision of war than our, our typical American uh, assumption of triumph. And um, there seems to be almost a sort of intoxicating um, experience of heroism. But we see ourselves as a hero. And we tell ourselves that we're the hero. And um, Where is, you know, I so said there's more wisdom in the house of sadness than the house of mirth from Song of Solomon. Where is the wisdom in defeat as opposed to victory? I think that, yeah, that's definitely true that, like, when all we get is victory, like, as Americans, for the most part, we basically have victory, uh, you don't quite see the other side of it and the tragedy and that we were wrong or that we were beat because we weren't strong enough or anything like that where it's just like, you know, like you said, war is hell. We haven't, we've had that, but always at the end we come through like war was hell, but we made it through and we won. Uh, whereas there it might be war was hell, but it's all over and nothing was worth it. Um, so we don't have that ability to see past that unless we're looking at other cultures. Other questions? Well, um, I really enjoyed your paper. Um, so I just saw The Incredibles 2 mm -hmm. a little bit ago, a little days ago, and uh, I have mixed feelings about that. But I'm going back to Incredibles mm -hmm. 1 here. Okay. And so, have you seen the movie? Oh, yes. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, so there's a scene where Mr. Incredible jumps and saves a man who's trying to commit suicide, right? And the scene is supposed to be very heroic. Mm -hmm. 
But then the events after it are the man basically suing Mr. Incredible because he, he was trying to kill himself, you know? <laughs> and Mr. Incredible stopped him from doing so, right? And he broke his neck, the man's neck in the process, right? So he's suing with the medical bills and stuff like that. Um, so that scene has always kind of stuck out to me just because it's, it's pretty interesting how it seems like even in something that seems obvious to us as being heroic, there's like always like two sides to it. Do you think that there's anything that you can just definitively say is heroic? Or is there always going to be that other side where it's like, I don't know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not heroic. Yeah, I, I feel that's very, uh, that's a good, that's a good example because there's always going to be another side. If you're, if you're going up against, if you have two opposing forces, both sides are going to have a vision and both sides are going to have a story. So even if one side is completely evil and, you know, just the worst ever, they still might have a story and still might have a reason for doing what they're doing. Uh, so I think that, yeah, every side definitely has a story and every side may have their own reasons for doing what they're wanting to do. They might not want to be saved or they might want to do what they're doing. So, you know, I feel like in uh, literature, or in more in modern media, we put more of like a faceless, uh, you know, these are zombies or aliens or something that we're fighting up against because there's no story that they're always just, you know, zombies or aliens or something. There's no other side where they're like, they have motives or they have reasons or they have you know, families that help them. So I feel like that is a, definitely a, uh, a problem with the media that all sides have, or all stories have two sides. Thank you. Other uh, questions? I would suggest maybe that um, a hero is somebody who allows good, who, who steps in in a situation to allow for the good. You talked about Ulysses and his, or Odysseus and his, uh, his epic and his story. Did he, uh, his, did, Whatever his good, his evil, his unheroic attitudes, his heroic attitudes, was there a good that resulted because of? I mean, you think of Mr. Incredible, or you think of uh, you, you, Americans in World War II. Did a, a possible good that would not have existed now exist you know, when you talk about your Odysseus? Yeah, so for Odysseus, the possible good that happened was he got home to his wife and that was a moral victory, that was a good thing that he did. Um, and with you know, uh, the Trojan War, they won, and that's hard to say if there was any you know, uh, good that came out of that, because I haven't quite looked at the past intro of the Greeks after that, but um, yeah, every, you know, it always ends differently. 